when school was out, I went to my parents' home and I went back into the back bedroom and there's one hospital bed on one side of the bed of the room and another one on the other. I walked in there, the shades were drawn, it was dark. My father was sitting on the edge of the bed in his pajamas with his feet dangling off the end of the bed and all of a sudden he looked like a little old man and a four-year-old little boy. And I sat over on the other side of the room and I looked over at him and this question came to me, Brenda, can you do for your father what he couldn't do for you? And I went over and I sat next to my dad so that my knee touched his knee and my shoulder touched his shoulder. And I looked over at him and I said, Dad, I want you to know that I love you. I think that you're a great guy. I'm so glad you're my dad. And of all the men that God could have given me to be my father, I'm so glad I got you. And my dad stood up and I stood up and he put his arms around me and I put my arms around him and he started to sob. Well, hello, friends of Bill W. and other friends. You have landed on Sober Speak. My name is John M. I am an alcoholic, and we are glad you are all here, especially newcomers. Newcomers, that is, both to recovery as a whole and newcomers to this podcast. Sober Speak is a podcast about recovery centered around the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. My job here on Sober Speak is simple. My job is to provide a platform to the amazing stories of recovery all around us. Consider Sober Speak, if you will, your meeting between meetings. Please remember, we do not speak for AA or any 12 step community. We represent only ourselves. We are here to share our experience, strength, and hope with those who wish to come along for the ride. Take what you want and leave the rest at the curb for the trash man to pick up. Well, hello, lords and ladies. That was the voice of Miss Brenda J that you heard at the beginning of this episode today. And you are going to hear much more from her in just a moment. But first things first, this episode, the one you are listening to right here, right now, Today is brought to you by Mr. Daryl. Daryl went out to our website, SoberSpeak.com, clicked on the Donate tab, and made a contribution. Thank you so much, Daryl, for your generosity. This episode is for you. As usual, we, Mr. Daryl, are going to let all the other listeners Mm, kind of tune into this and listen in themselves, but this episode goes straight out to you. And I am so honored to be the chairperson for this meeting between meetings, and I'm glad you are all here. And I want to let you know something right at the beginning of this. I am uh, actually recording this in the great state of Colorado, and as I record it this week, I am surrounded by, well, I have my son in the room. I have my wife in the room. She has made a bunch of brownies, which she is taking over to an Alateen event. My son is eating a Lunchable, which he absolutely loves, if you know what those are, and listening to some stuff on YouTube at the same time. And I have basically hijacked the kitchen table here. Around me, I have all my podcast equipment. We have uh, the Crested Butte Mountain Conference uh, 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 agenda out here. I have a notepad. Uh, I have a big book. Uh, we have some earbuds and, uh, there's all kinds of snacks around us. Like, uh, oh, my kids like, uh, Belvitas and donuts and, uh, mini crackers and Cheerios and all kinds of stuff. But, uh, it is, and my, my daughter's, uh, uh, Fold away bed is uh, rolled out here next to me, and I absolutely love it. It is the sign of life all around us. But nonetheless, I uh, kind of digress there. So once again, what is the meaning and what is the significance of August 30th here on this planet Earth, you ask? Well, we are going to have a shindig in Frisco, Texas. And if you're interested in that, go to our website, SoberSpeak.com, and uh, it will be explained there. My bride actually posted that uh, information out on the uh, website recently. It'll give all the basic info, like uh, the address and the time 
time, date, location, but we're going to be having Jimmy D in. Uh, and if you haven't heard from Jimmy D, he is on episodes number 54 and 55, and uh, we're calling it An Evening with Mr. Jimmy D, and it is at the Grace Avenue United Methodist Church in Frisco, Texas. Uh, and if you have any questions on that, just send me an email. But uh, I'm at john at soberspeak.com. If you do plan on being there and I have not met you before, please send me an email. I'd love to be on the lookout for you. Keep in mind this event is free. We will pass the basket toward the end of the meeting. If you got a couple bucks to put in, fantastic. If not, no worries. We just want you there. And, uh, as I'm uh, talking about this also, if you'd like to join our uh, secret Facebook group, it's free. Uh, send me an email with your Facebook account email associated with it to John, J-O-H-N, at Soberspeak.com. All right, so today I'm going to get right into a couple of uh, pieces of listener feedback, and then I'm going to get you into Brenda J because she has quite a story. Uh, she is quite a lady. She has been on the Sober Speak podcast before, by the way. It's uh, episode five zero, episode 50. It's called Brenda J. Do not be discouraged if you want to go listen to more of her after this is done. But a couple of pieces of listener feedback stood out to me this week. And the first one came in from Miss Kristen. Kristen writes in and she says, Good afternoon, John. I am a religious, sober speak listener. God willing, I will be seven months sober on Thursday. Fantastic, Kristen. Treat, treatment was not an option for me. I got sober in the rooms of AA. I credit your podcast with helping me get through the roughest parts of my early sobriety. I'm lucky enough to be in an office by myself for the first few months, and I streamed Sober Speak all day long. Thank you so much for all the work you do. Also, I had taken a hiatus from Facebook, but would like to be added to the group now that I'm back on. You know, Facebook can be good for people, too. You just got to use it in the right way. Anyway, uh, and that was my comment, by the way, not uh, Kristen's. And, uh, and then she gives me her email associated with it. Uh, and Miss Kristen is from the wild and wonderful West Virginia. Speaking of West Virginia, you know, my son always sings that song to me. What's that song you sing to me about West Virginia? Country Road. Yeah, that's it. Country Road, take me home to the place I belong. West Virginia, mama, take me home, Country Road. If you ever run into Mr. John Denver, Kristen, tell him I said hello. But it would be very strange because I believe he's dead now. But that would make the story even better. Nonetheless... Kristen from wild and wonderful West Virginia, uh, we are so glad you wrote in. And uh, thank you, my dear son, for helping me uh, with remembering what that song is. All right. Now, Christina writes, writes in, and she posted something in our secret Facebook. And I just absolutely love this uh, whole um, reading here. Uh, my wife read it and my wife said she is such a good writer. So I wanted to share it with you guys. And Chris, Christina says, I want to share about the bottom I experienced while in AA. Last December, I was 35 days sober, attending daily AA meetings, had a sponsor, and I was questioning whether I was an alcoholic. Before I left for a long-awaited vacation to Jamaica at an all-inclusive family resort, I discussed it with my sponsor and really hoped to keep my sobriety, but wasn't sure I'd be able to. She let me know that whether I drank or didn't, there'd be a lesson in it. A very wise sponsor you have there, Miss Christina. Well, I made it to the resort lounge at the Jamaican airport I broke down in tears at the sight of all the alcohol and felt I didn't have the fight in me. We're told that if a true alcoholic, there will come a time where we have no defense against the first drink, and that was mine. I drank the whole vacation, was really trying to enjoy the experience with my family, but became increasingly restless, irritable, and discontent. 
It was a Griswold family vacation for sure. <laughs> in parentheses, ever try to find a lice comb in a foreign country? Question <laughs> mark. And I wasn't connected to anything greater than myself. If you can imagine how my defects were running rampant. After matching my yet-to-be ADHD diagnosed daughter's hour-long fit with one of my own, I consoled myself on the balcony with a glass of wine. As I sat there overlooking the beautiful ocean and jungle and sky, the sounds of the birds and frogs and crickets were all around me. I felt such a deep hatred for myself, a feeling of uselessness, a pathetic self-pity that I was sitting in paradise and yet couldn't feel a shred of gratitude. I had a moment of clarity in that moment that if I had any chance to heal this broken, broken inner being of mine, I needed to be sober. It was the only chance I had. Now, like any good alcoholic, I drank for the rest of the vacation. I can imagine. My last drink was on the plane ride home. But I'll say that I'm extremely grateful for that crazy trip and the misery I felt on that balcony because I haven't questioned whether I'm an alcoholic since. I'm grateful for the grace that's lifted the desire to drink, Grateful for the fellowship that walks with me and shows with me shows me the way, and truly grateful to the twelve steps that are slowly but surely unblocking me from the sunlight of the spirit in all capital letters. So yes, there was a lesson in that quote research unquote that I really needed. I needed to realize I'm one of you! Exclamation point. And then she asked a question at the end, which I really like. And she said, and this was posted in the Facebook group. By the way, she got all kinds of comments on this. And she says, what was your bottom like and what lessons did it bring? So if you want to answer that, join us in the super secret Facebook group. Or you can just send me an email to john at silverspeak.com. And uh, I would love to hear your feedback. All right. Now, on to Miss Brenda J, and we will have additional listener feedback at the end. And my wife is sitting here in the background watching me record this, and she gave me a big thumbs up when I said, and there will be additional feedback at the end. Right, Shannon? Right. All right. All right. God bless you, everybody. Thanks for listening in. Enjoy Brenda J. I know that you will. She's got one heck of a story, and we'll talk soon. God, I offer myself to you to build with me and to do with me as you will. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do your will. Take away my difficulties that victory over them may bear witness to those that I will help of your power, your love, and your way of life. May I do your will always. My name is Brenda. I'm a recovering lesbian, Hispanic, Catholic, alcoholic, drug addict, full-figured woman. Tell those people still standing outside, they better come in. It's finna get good in here. <laughs> the last time I had to drink or do drugs to change the way I was feeling was on July the 3rd of 1990. I've been clean and sober ever since then. Grateful to God for that. Absolutely. You can clap. It's all right. It's all right. Antes de empezar, le quiero dar muchas gracias a ustedes por la oportunidad de estar aquí. Le doy gracias a Dios por, por este día que me ha concedido. Y con su permiso voy a hablar en inglés. For those of you who don't understand Spanish, what I said was, hi. <laughs> Thank you.
Um, I wanted to read you something that I wrote in my journal on Wednesday because I didn't know where else to start. Wednesday, November 24th, 2004, 8.30 p.m. I'm sitting in Houston, Texas the day before Thanksgiving here for the conference. I speak Saturday. That gives me three days to try and figure out how to push five words past my lips without soaking them with my tears. The doctor told my father that he had four weeks to live. Tomorrow, Thanksgiving, we come to the end of three weeks. I knew this would be my father's last Thanksgiving and I'm sitting in Houston. I came to leave there. I came because I felt my soul shriveling up and dying just from the pain. I came because I promised I would. I came because it's God's work that I do. I didn't want to leave my sisters and my brothers. My heart aches deeply and slowly and loudly and completely. I came because it's God's work I do. There was a man who once wrote that in every person's life, there comes a time when there is no exit. When the measure of a person's courage is taken. We have come to that moment for me. Now, the people on the committee are like, this was supposed to be the happy speaker. <laughs> Way to depress everybody. I don't care. <laughs> Here are a few suggestions I picked up on my way here from fellow AA members. Be sure you don't cuss. Don't forget to tell them that it gets better. I'm going to go ahead and check that one off. Don't forget to talk about the steps. Try and keep everything in order. Um, tell them about your drinking. Don't talk too much about the drinking. Talk about being sober. Don't cry too much. Be clever, charming, and funny. Uh, don't entertain them. That's not why we're here. Um, <laughs> read a lot from the books. It will impress them. Um, don't read the book. They can read it on their own. <laughs> don't forget them to tell them that it gets better, and whatever you do, don't cuss. <laughs> well, goddamn. <laughs> If I have to worry about all of that, I'm not going to know what the hell I came to tell you. So I'd like to thank the people for their suggestions. <laughs> if you're new, you too can have this. Yay. Um, I, I have no idea what you're about to hear. None. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. What are you going to do? Fire me? The truth is, is that I did come to talk about a few things, and if you're, in, if you know, I want to know about a speaker, are they going to suck? You know, because after all, there is a dance soon, and I do have a little bit more prepping to do, and what a waste of time, you know? So I'm going to tell you what I'm going to talk about, and then you can slip out in a minute if, you know, you're not happy with it. Um, mostly it's going to be about me. <laughs> Not a lot about you, but some of it about you, but, but not a lot because then I have to make amends for that and I don't want to. Um, I would read you stuff out of the book to impress you and all that, but I'm too tired. You know, and um, I, I, I'm going to tell you the truth about 
about power and relationships and love and forgiveness and holding on and sacrifice and trying and grieving and power and and I'm going to talk about God because that's all I have to talk about really and for those of you who don't like God I get that okay um, the preacher would say on Sundays God has big plans for you well, I kind of knew what those were, and I was trying to postpone them as long as possible. <laughs> but when I talk about God, it's just because I don't know what else to call whatever it is that makes the sun come up and go to bed at night without me having to be there to directly supervise that. <laughs> whatever will take a sperm and an egg and turn it into a baby, I don't know how to do that. Whatever makes lightning, I don't know how to do that. I don't know what else to call it. Whatever you want to call it is fine with me. I'm trying to talk about whatever it is that's moved me from my last drink to tonight. You know? And, and, and this is what happened to me. Now, you may not ever have to do some of the things that I've had to do. You may have to do all of them. It doesn't matter. The one thing I love about Alcoholics Anonymous is that we get to do it the way it works for us. And by the way, if you hear an old timer say to you, you know, there's only one way to do it and it's in the book and do it this way, run. <laughs> if you're new, see, I'm trying to get everybody, okay? If you're new, your problems do not, do not frighten us, no matter what they are. Your problems don't scare us. Your solutions, however, scare the shit out of all of us. <laughs> it never fails. You see newcomers and they're like, oh, I'm feeling a little lonely. I think I'm going to get married. <laughs> Woo, I'm thinking, get a puppy. Hold up. <laughs> you know... I don't have any money. I believe I'm going to go rob the bank. So if you have ideas, don't follow through with them. Um, I don't talk a whole lot about what it was like when I drank because I'm, I think you got that part down, <laughs> right? That whole throwing up thing and all of that. I guess you know how to do that. I had my first drink at the age of four. I, I took it up as a career at the age of 12. I went to a party for like 12 years and then came home. <laughs> I sobered up when I was 24. I'm 38 now. Um, and I drank until I took the last drop of the last beer on the last day for the last reason. My drunken log is about three sentences long, and then I want to get to what's happened since I've been here. Sometimes, you know, I got this thing about people who've been sober for 48 years, and they only get to it the last four minutes of the hour. Okay, that's just me. But, <laughs> but I want to know how you managed to stay in Alcoholics Anonymous with all of these other really insane people and, and somehow managed to improve the quality of your life at the same time. That's what I want to talk about. I drank at the beginning to feel good. Then one day I started drinking so I could feel normal. And then at the end I was drinking to not feel at all. That's it. That's why I drank. Um, one of the things that you'll learn about me is that, uh, you know, I'm not much for small talk. I just like to get to the crap, okay? Okay. So, I mean, I should have thanked the committee and the basket and all that stuff, and that's all good, but whatever, okay? So, <laughs> thanks. So, um, you know, you're supposed to do that stuff. And, okay, let me think of some. No, it doesn't matter. I was 24 years old. My father was an alcoholic, and I was having a, a couple problems with him. So I called the treatment facility. And so, you know, I didn't know, you know, would they come get him or what? But I called them and I said, listen, I'm having a few problems with my dad. He drinks too much. And I was wondering, could you help out with that? And they said, oh, that'd be good. Um, what are you doing tomorrow? I said, oh, nothing. They said, we have family day at the treatment center. Why don't you come? It's from 8 to 4 tomorrow. 
I thought, oh, well, they probably want to check or something before they come get them. So I, I went, and, um, and I went to family day, and then everybody who was there, their family came in from the outside, and they were going to do role-playing and stuff, and I didn't have anybody there. So I walked around, and I asked people, hey, excuse me, do you have family here? You do? Okay. Do you have family? You don't? Okay, I'm it. <laughs> and there was this guy... There was this guy named Pat that I later found, Patrick, I don't know what the hell his name was, but I later found out that he was a Hells Angels motorcyclist, you know, and that was fun. And so I was his family, and I went that day, and we were, you know, like in heated discussions with each other and, and really working out some stuff that we, um, <laughs> I mean, I was crying and hugging him, and I mean, ooh. <coughs> So when we came to the end of that Tuesday, I said, I, I love you. I love all of you. I'll be back next Tuesday. And I went for four weeks. <laughs> That's how long the program lasted, four Tuesdays. And at the end of the last Tuesday, the lady who was at the treatment facility said, would you like to go to a meeting with us? Um, no. <laughs> She said, well, we're going to go to a meeting. I said, a meeting of what? Um, she said, an A meeting. And there's an Al-Anon meeting across the hall, so you could go to that. And I said, well, okay. She said, okay, go ahead and get in the van. <laughs> now, if y'all are going to get ahead of me, I'm not going to share. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. I'm going to keep it to myself. So I got in the van, and they drove us to the AA meeting, and all the AAs went that way, and I went to Al-Anon, and that's where I started. And, and um, I went to that first meeting, and, you know, the people in Al-Anon, they were really cool. They're like, God, oh, welcome, welcome. You're welcome to come anytime you want. We do, however, have another meeting <laughs> that you might benefit from, you know? And so... Um, so I went, I, the, the van lady was there one day and I said, I, can I ask you a question? I said, my sister made me really mad yesterday and I didn't want to drink and I took a drink. She said, oh, I said, and then the day before that, my sister really, really made me mad and I didn't want to drink and I took a drink. She said, oh, <laughs> she says, I want you to try something. She said, why don't you say, my name is Brenda and I'm an alcoholic. I looked at her like she had lost her damn mind. I said, well, because it's not the truth. She said, it doesn't matter. Just say it. <laughs> the only thing running through my mind is I'm really considering slapping you, you know. <laughs> so after, a, a, you know, working up to it, I said, my name is Brenda and I'm an alcoholic. And I started to cry. I mean, just because everything that I'd ever hidden about came crashing down on me. I had no idea. I drank with my family. I'm one of nine kids, one mom, one dad, a puppy that didn't make it out of childhood. But um, they, I drank with them, and they all drank like me, and there wasn't anything wrong with that. So I had no idea that I was an alcoholic. She goes, there's a women's meeting here tomorrow night on Friday night. It's at 7 o'clock. Here's my number. I'll meet you here. Yeah, that's a good idea. I am not coming back, you know. And so the next day I thought of several good reasons to call her and say, I can't go. So I showed up. <laughs> and I went to the meeting and I walked to the door of Alcoholics Anonymous and she said, I brought you this far. If you're coming in, you got to come in alone. And I stepped over the threshold into AA. The first meeting I went to was on trust. Yeah, that messed me up quick. <laughs> I was really interested in what women alcoholics look like. You know, I had no idea. So I went to this meeting, and I don't remember much about it, except I got in there, and I looked around, and everything was stained and colored, you know. Whoo, beautiful. And, and everybody was white. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. I thought, man, I am in a prayer meeting. 
So we had the meeting or whatever, and then this little lady comes up after me. She said, hi, my name is Pam. Hi, Pam. She said, a bunch of us are going to the kettle. Would you like to come? I said, uh, no. She said, all right, good. Get in the van. See, but I ain't no dummy. I said, oh, you know what? I'm going to take my own car, but I'm going to meet you there. She said, get in the van. <laughs> so I got in the van, and we drove to the kettle, and they set this long table out. And I remember I looked down the table, and I was sitting there with 12 white women. <laughs> the image of the Last Supper. <laughs> So they told me there was a meeting at 11 the next day, and I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm going to be there. So I went to the meeting, and in the middle of the meeting, there's this ruckus out in the lizard lounge, and um, the half measures room, what do you call it? That place over there for people too well to come in. Um <laughs> They'll edit that out, okay? Um, so anyway, there's this ruckus out there, and then I hear sirens, and there's cops coming and stuff, and I'm like, oh, hell, you know, we're busted. I, I didn't, wasn't even doing anything. Right? <laughs> I knew somebody had some stuff up in here. So I opened the door to the room just in time to see this guy take this mug and whack this guy on the head and split him open, and blood went everywhere, and I thought, oh. <gasps> That's messed up. <laughs> I don't need this in AA. This is like home. <laughs> you know, I don't need this. And, and, um, and one lady comes up to me. She said, I've been here 22 years and none like that has ever happened. I'm like, I should be grateful then or what? You know? <laughs> so I started going to this group and these people, they like tried to help me and I tried to like not let them. Um, so I'd go to meetings with um, the newspaper. And as soon as the meeting would start, I'd sit back and open up the sports page. And there was this one guy, and he totally hated it. He's like, if you're going to read the newspaper, you don't remember. I loved him. Um, so the next day, I brought my headphones. Because <laughs> I was willing, right? Um, so I started going to this meeting, and the women tried to help me, and there, there was this, Pam, she gave me her number, and she goes, here, we talked about it, and you need a sponsor. <laughs> right now. <laughs> Here's my number, call me. I'm like, um, when, do, when do I call you? She said, anytime you have an idea. <laughs> That's just wrong. <laughs> so I start going to meetings and I'm trying not to, you know, like it. And, you know, and they're like, would you like to share? I'm like, yeah, all y'all can kiss my. And so, you know, I was open to the whole concept of being sober. And I'm trying, I'm trying the best I can. And one day this lady comes up to me. She said, come here. She said, why don't you pick up the ashtrays and empty them out? in the trash can. I'll just get into the good part. That's good. Sit down. <laughs> and girl, you look good. All right, sit down. <clears throat> if y'all's phones ring, it better be for me, okay? I'm telling y'all that right now. So this lady says, why don't you pick up the ashtrays? And I thought, oh, huh, uh, it's because I'm brown. <laughs> And we're going to have to take care of this today. <laughs> so
so I walked to the furthest corner of the AA room and got one of those big old glass ashtrays that was stacked this high with ashes because, you know, we don't smoke a little in AA. And I picked it up and I flung it across the AA room into the trash can. She said, come here. I thought, I, don't, I will kick your ass. I'm, I'm on my way. So I, I walked over there to her, and she said, come here. We are not going to start you off with ashtrays. <laughs> I felt like I had been demoted. <laughs> she said, why don't you pick up the styrofoam coffee cups? <laughs> they don't go very far when you throw them. So I did, and I was working it, and I was just trying to stay sober, and I enrolled in school. I don't know what the hell I was doing. I'm just, you know, trying to follow the directions. And, and um, there was this guy there, and he had like two years, and his name was Pat, and he was a cocaine addict, but he's like coming to AA too, whatever. I don't know. I don't care. So he, we and him, we started hanging out and stuff, and one day we were at the club, and we were like mopping and sweeping because, you know, I was hoping to be promoted again to ashtrays. And... Um, <laughs> And so I said to him, I said, Pat, I don't know what's the matter with me, man. I said, I have all this information. I've been coming here like 35 days, which is like, you know, 100 years in dog years, you know, when you're new. I said, and I want to drink. He said, I know exactly what you're talking about. I have been where you are, and I know how to get out. I thought, oh. Thank you, God. I said, what do I have to do? He said, well, if you feel like drinking after everything you know, what you really need to do today is you need to sleep with me. <laughs> I didn't say he was bright. I mean, we were both after the same thing, but... Um, so I went outside to the payphone, and I, I said, hello, um... Pam, this is Brenda. I was up at the club, and I'm talking to Pat, and, he, and I told him that I wanted to drink, and he said if I didn't want to drink that I should sleep with him, and you said for me to call you anytime I had an idea. <laughs> and this sounded like an idea. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. It's for you! <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I don't know what she told him. I never saw the boy again. Never. That was my home group for like 10 years. And I, I, she, I think she killed him. <laughs> <coughs> By the way, if you're new, whether you're a boy or a girl, if you're new and somebody wants to like take you to coffee and you get this feeling in your stomach, don't go. <laughs> Ask them what step they're on and tell them you're going to call your sponsor, run that by your sponsor, and you'll get back to them about coffee. Or go. Who the hell cares? <laughs> oh, now you hear the newcomers. Yeah! <laughs> some guy in the back is like, finally, she got to some good shit. <coughs> So I, I did, I, I kept going and kept showing up and kept doing the best I could and, and tried to, you know, do the best. I, I started working the steps and I'd read everything I could and, and next thing I knew, I got a year and, my, and I invited my family to come and some of them did and the little, I have 23 nephews and nieces <laughs> and, he, and 18 great nephews and nieces. Yeah. Um, and so some of them came and we stayed for the AA dance and stuff. It was really cool. But I keep rocking right along trying to do the best I can. And I was in college and I literally came to in an English before the 1800s class. 
I don't know. I just looked at the book and looked at the, one, the degree that required the least amount of math and went in that direction. <laughs> I am not kidding. So I'm just taking classes and stuff, and all of a sudden I get this letter from the dean's office saying, Ms. Hossel, you're about 12 hours from graduating. You might want to come file a degree plan. <laughs> so I went, and, um, and I graduated. And now, see, I'm trying to stay sober, trying to fix things up with my nine brothers and sisters as the best I could. And the best thing I could figure out was that I needed to show up for the lives of their children. So I went to violin recitals. I went to Little Olympics. I went to... I have heard more concert music than should be required of any sober person. (laughs) But I just kept showing up. When one of my nephews got his driver's license, I went to the DMV and I had pom-poms and, you know... (laughs) A little cowbell, and he's like, oh, my God. <laughs> my, one of my nephews has muscular dystrophy, so he was in the Special Olympics, so I'd make banners and streamers and run along the side of the road. It was great. Um, they're like, God, she's drinking. I know she is. <laughs> so it comes graduation night, and, you know, I, I, I walk in the Coliseum in San Angelo, and I look up over my left shoulder, and there's this whole section that has streamers and balloons and... P- there are all my nephews and nieces and my brothers and sisters. Absolutely. You know, and I looked at my father, and the only thing I'd ever seen in my father's eyes had been disappointment for as long as I can remember. My one, one memory of, of my relationship with my father when I was a teenager was he called me into his room one day and he said, I am sick and tired of how hard you make things for your mother. When she dies... I better not see one tear in your eye or I'm going to knock every goddamn tooth out of your mouth. Do you understand me? I said, yes, sir, I do. He figured out how to do that part, but he didn't figure out how to do the little part when I was four. The little part where he should have picked me up and said, man, you are so cute. Look at those eyes. (laughs) You're absolutely beautiful. I am so glad I have you. Of all the little girls that God could have given me, I'm so glad I got you. That didn't happen. That didn't happen. But he figured out how to do the other part really well. So I'm moving right along. I'm trying to fix things. Next thing I know, I graduated from college with a teaching degree. Yeah. Thanks for not leaving the room to check your kids out of school. (laughs) Um, and on the morning of graduation, there were 83 people in my graduating class and three of us got jobs. I went on an interview the morning of graduation and I got the job. And there was this one guy in my class who was totally pissed about that. He said, you know, the only reason they gave you the job is because you're a woman and you're Hispanic. I said, it's about time it paid off. (laughs) Hell, I don't care if they gave it to me because they think I see Jesus. I don't give a rat's ass. (laughs) So I I, I start teaching school. I get to the end of my first week of school and the phone rings in the office and it's for me and my, it's my little sister. I thought that's cool. She's calling to like congratulate me on my first week of school that of, you know, going five days in a row. Um, and, and she said, Brenda, she said, I'm calling to tell you that we took dad to, um, to the doctor and we found out he has cancer and he's having surgery on Monday and you need to come home. And I started to cry because I was sober and I didn't want to go. When school was out, I went to my parents' home, and I went back into the back bedroom, and there was one hospital bed on one side of the bed of the room and another one on the other. I walked in there. The shades were drawn. It was dark. My father was sitting on the edge of the bed in his pajamas with his feet dangling off the end of the bed, and all of a sudden he looked like a little old man. And a four-year-old little boy. And I sat over on the other side of the room, and I looked over at him, and this question came to me. Brenda, can you do for your father what he couldn't do for you? 
And I went over and I sat next to my dad so that my knee touched his knee and my shoulder touched his shoulder. And I looked over at him and I said, Dad, I want you to know that I want you to know that I love you. I think that you're a great guy. I'm so glad you're my dad. And of all the men that God could have given me to be my father, I'm so glad I got you. And my dad stood up. And I stood up. And he put his arms around me, and I put my arms around him. And he started to sob. And I share that with you because everything I'd ever been waiting for from him came to me at that moment when I gave it away. Don't wait. Whatever got you waiting, don't wait. Go give it away. I told my father how proud I was of him that that it must have been really hard to come home every day to nine kids. But he came home and he worked. I start sponsoring women and that's a scary thought, you know? <laughs> You know, and then I get women just like me, which is how it works, by the way. <clears throat> and I try and pray with them and stuff. And one day I'm, I'm, in, the, I'm in an auditorium and, and my phone rings and it's one of the women that I sponsor. And she goes, I really need to pray. And I'm like, okay. So I had really bad reception. And I said, my creator, she says, my creator, I am now, she goes, I can't hear you. I am now willing that you, I can't hear you. So I said, I am now willing that you should have all of me. <laughs> At the exact same moment, the two teenage boys that I had taught a couple of years earlier were walking by and they're like, all right, yeah. Um, crap like that happens to me all the time. You know, if, if, you're, if you're sober and you're serene and there's not a whole lot going on in your recovery, get on a steering committee somewhere. <laughs> Any steering committee will do. Um, I'll tell you what. Um, I, I love being sober and, and working the steps is the answer. Here are the steps we took, which are suggested as, as a program of recovery. I, I am here to tell you, if you're new, take notes. You can, I have not figured out how to stay sober by simply being on the dance committee. <laughs> I have not figured out how to stay sober by being the most popular person in AA. I, I went home from my first few meetings and people were like, keep coming back, keep coming back. And I thought, I kid you not, I went home and I told my mother, Mom, they, they told me to come back. She said, I think you should. <laughs> I, said, I said, Mom, they don't have a leader. <laughs> I asked who was in charge and they said no one. I think they're going to ask me. <laughs> And I would go through all those steps, except I have some really funny stories, so I want to get to those. Um, <clears throat> the, only, the only wrong way, in my experience, the only wrong way to do the steps, you need to know this, is to leave them undone. Other than that, everything's fair game. It's great. I can't screw anything up so bad that God can't fix it. 
So I'm going right along. I have this list of people that I may need to make amends to. I went to my sponsor and we wrote down how I was going to fix everything I'd broken. And I got started on my list. And for my third year birthday, what I gave myself was permission to finish the list. At 11.50 that night, I drove over to my sister's work where she was working. I walked in the front door and I said, Letty, I want you to know I am so sorry. I took a drink and I left. And although I never did anything to hurt you directly, I know that there were days when you needed me to be your sister, and I didn't know how to do that. And that night, I got in my car, and I sobbed uncontrollably, because I was free. For the first time in my life, I was free. That's why I drank to be free. And instead, I was caught in the bondage of self. And I wish I could tell you that I worked the steps and got well, but I have proof to the contrary. <laughs> I'd like to submit evidence number K. <laughs> what happened? What happened was that I went to the video store and I said, I'd like to rent this movie. And she, I, it was 99 cents, right? And she said, that'll be two ninety nine. I said, uh-uh. I went and got it from over there. It says 99 cents on the wall. You're trying to rip me off, right? I'm not going to have it. Well, while I'm throwing this little tirade, the little stock guy went to go get the sign that said two ninety nine. So I handled that in the only dignified way I could. I said, you know what? I don't want it. <laughs> and I stormed out of the store. I didn't make it to my car. I was crying. I didn't even have to call my sponsor on this when I got it. <laughs> there I go <laughs> back into the store I know I have to make amends now I got to wait in line to make amends <laughs> people wanted me to cut okay they're like do you need to go ahead of us is there an emergency here <laughs> oh. So I finally get up to this cash register and I said, you know, I look really good at this point. I said, I just want you to know that I shouldn't have talked to you like that and I know better. <laughs> I am so sorry and I'm going to do everything I can not to ever do that. <laughs> she said, ma'am, I have never seen you before in my life. <laughs> but I do believe you're looking for Bridget and she's in the back of the store now. She's... <laughs> I have to tell you, I wanted to say to her, could you tell her? <laughs> so there I go to the back of the store. Now, people have stopped shopping. <laughs> There she goes, that's her right there. <laughs> Which one do you think is Bridget? <laughs> so I go all the way to the back of the store. I got snot coming now. It's, I mean, it's good. I walk back there, I do my little spiel again, and she's like, it's all right, don't worry, it's okay. Thanks for coming back. <laughs> I know people wanted to clap as I was leaving. That was good. <laughs> I got in my car and I had that feeling again, that feeling of being free. You know, that's it. I started teaching school. I started teaching sixth grade, Hormoneville as I like to call it. Because the kids won't bring their crap, but they will bring their hormones every day. Okay? I don't know. I don't have any idea. I was drunk in the sixth grade. I don't know what we talked about. So... 
they give me this class, and in the first year, they scored perfect 100 in reading and a perfect 100 in math on the toss test, which is, you know, by the way, we determine who goes to heaven now. <laughs> the superintendent's office called and said, Miss Hossel, that was magnificent. Would you mind giving an in-service to a bunch of teachers? There's about 800 teachers, and we'd like for you to tell them how you did that. I would love to! <laughs> so I get in front of these teachers. I have no more an idea what the hell I'm doing. And I said, what do you want to know? And one teacher stands up. She says, yes, I'd like to know how it was that you happened to um, um, help the children master the objective of the forming of the manip." What the hell did you just say? I, I said, look, here's how it went. I went and did my work. I got in touch with my grief and my anger and my fear and my abandonment and my... I did... <laughs> I said, I did my work. And then every day I showed up spiritually, emotionally, physically, and mentally for these children. That's how they made a hundred. Go do that or go do something else. Yeah. They never asked me to do another in-service. <laughs> Jeez, don't be somewhere where the future comes to you every day, you know? Um, so I'm teaching and my kids love school. Sixth graders, can't wait to get there. Will not miss a day because they know I will talk about them, okay? I had, a, I had a little girl who had four wisdom teeth taken out, came back to school, completely packed up like Alvin the Chipmunk. I had a little boy, he fainted in class one day. I thought he was playing. I'm like, kick him, see what happens. He was actually out cold, okay? So, um, <laughs> um, so they took him to the, in the, in the ambulance, whatever. About 2 o'clock, he, he's back. I said, Thomas, what are you doing here? He said, my mom's outside. She wants to talk to you. <laughs> Man, and I have to tell you, my immediate reaction was, do you remember being kicked? <laughs> <laughs> I go outside and I talk to his mom and I'm like, what's up? She said, I don't know. He fainted. They're good. They ran some tests. They think he has some sort of seizure. I said, what's he doing here? She, she said, Ms. Hosso, he said that if he fainted again, that you'd know what to do. <laughs> he didn't want to miss it. He didn't want to miss it. I needed somebody like that when I was in the sixth grade. If somebody would have looked at me and said, Brenda, your life is worth something to me. Somebody's going to say that to them. I'm here to tell you, if you're new and you think you're leaving and you don't think Alcoholics Anonymous is for you, if you don't fit in or you don't think you wear the right clothes, there's a seat in Alcoholics Anonymous and it's the one right next to me. I hate that crap. You know, we all get, you know, we have our little sets of friends and stuff, and there's people dying on the fringes of Alcoholics Anonymous because they smell bad. Or because they don't drive what I drive, or because they don't dress the way I dress, and they're dying right here in front of us. For what? For my comfort? If you're one of those people, don't go. Stay. Come to one more meeting. You know, a gentleman that I was visiting with earlier said, Brenda, we've been having the Houston Roundup for 23 years, and you're the first Hispanic speaker we've ever had. Granted, I know I screwed it up, and now it's going to be another 30, but that's <laughs> beside the point. <laughs> Teach you to go there. Um, I just want to tell you a couple things and then I'm going to go. I have no idea what the hell time I started or when I should be done. Um, 
But I want to tell you that I, I was minding my own business and in a lot of pain in recovery. And if you've been here a while and you've been in a lot of pain, I can just share my story. And this is how it goes. I was, I was going to institutions, sponsoring women, going to AA, reading the book, surrendering my life to God, and being sober hurt. Hurt. Couldn't figure it out. Would have climbed to the tallest tree if I thought that would have helped. Couldn't figure it out. I was visiting Dallas every once in a while to go get a drink of water from them, okay? So I finally looked at God and I said, you know what, you little... Um, <laughs> I give up. I don't know what you want. I have completely surrendered my life to you and I don't know what else to do. What do you want? And God looked at me and said, Brenda, what do you want? Go to that deepest part of your soul and find out what it is that you want. And you can have it. Whatever it is. You've been faithful. You've been loyal. What is it? What can I give you? And I closed my eyes and went down to the deepest part of my soul and I said to God, What I most want in that place is to be with you. I don't want anything in my life to happen outside of your presence. God said, good, here's a list of directions. And it started with, go tell your mom that you're gay. Go tell your dad that you're gay. Go tell your nine brothers and sisters that you're gay. I want you to move to Dallas, enroll in the per, uh, Perkins School of Theology, in the relationship that you've been. I mean, there. I'm like, well, hell. <laughs> I mean, my family knew I was gay, but it's different when you get the memo. So I went to my mother, my very Catholic step in when the Pope's not available mother. <laughs> and by the way, by the way, I've become a lot of things sober. A teacher, a professional, a, a woman, a friend, a lover. My greatest joy and accomplishment is that I finally grew up to be my mother and father's daughter. So I went to my mother and I said, Mom, I said, I love you. I want you to know that you mean everything in the world to me. I'm gay and I wanted you to know that I'm moving to Dallas to go to school. And I just kept talking and talking because she knows the rules of conversation. <laughs> you know, and if I stopped, she would have thought it was her turn. But I did, I stopped talking finally, and she turned around, she goes, let me tell you something. And my heart dropped, because I was afraid that I had heard God's voice coming from one direction, and that for the first time I was about to hear my mother's voice coming from another. She says, I want you to know that I love you more than I love my other children. And I love you more than that because you are gay. There's room in God's world for everybody. There is no doubt in my mind that this is exactly what you're supposed to do. Not only do you have my support, you go with my blessing. I said, Mom, about Dad? She said, I got him. My father knows I sleep with women or if he thinks I'm just really happy. Um, it doesn't matter. I went and I told my brothers and sisters and, that I was leaving San Angelo where I'd grown up and where we'd lived our lives and every single one of them cried. And they said, we're going to miss you. You have sacrificed your life for our children. And I moved to Dallas, and I've been there since November of last year. I teach school there. I teach music and fine arts. Because I don't know anything about either one of those things. <laughs> I'm not.
not kidding. If any of you would ever like to be a guest in my room, please let me know. I have 941 students. I'm currently sponsoring 941 newcomers. <laughs> they, I have a little desk, a little timeout desk, and, and when you like mess up or cross the line or whatever, you have to go sit over there, and you have to write down what it is that you did that was wrong and, and, and who you hurt and what you could have done instead. <laughs> <laughs> and how you're going to fix it. And then they bring their writing up to me and we review it. I, all, those kids are going to wind up in A and go, I did this shit already. <laughs> one little boy and he's a frequent flyer to the timeout chair <coughs> and I said the other day he called a little girl stupid or something and I said Jesus he says I'm going <laughs> I um I was working a few weeks ago and and they called me that my father was very ill and I went home and um and I've been in San Angelo ever since November the 4th, and, and I haven't been able to go back home. And I miss Alcoholics Anonymous. If you have a chance to go to a meeting every day, go. Go for me. I can't go right now. And when I leave here tomorrow morning, I'm probably going to go home in a few days, in a couple weeks, bury my father. And I have to tell you, I don't want to go. <laughs> my mother's very old. She has, she has Alzheimer's. And she's trying to help my father through this. And my dad says to my mom, I don't want to go and leave you. They've been married 54 years. And I told my mom, Mom. When the train comes by to get dad, if there's another seat, you better take it. <laughs> I said, we're going to miss you. I want to grow up to be the woman you've been. And I'm going to miss you, but I want you to go with dad. <laughs> I asked God to help me get sober, and in exchange, I told him that I'd do everything I could not to miss one more moment of my life. So just know that when I leave here and those days come to me and my family, I want you to know that I will stand there with you in my heart. A service. Gladly rendered, obligations squarely met, troubles well accepted or solved with God's help, the knowledge that at home and in the world outside we are partners in a common effort, the well understood fact that in God's sight all human beings are important. The proof that love freely given surely brings a full return. The certainty that we are no longer isolated and alone in self-constructed prisons. The surety that we need no longer be square pegs in round holes, but fit and belong in God's scheme of things. These are the permanent and legitimate satisfactions of right living for which no amount of pomp and circumstance, no heap of material possessions could ever substitute. True ambition is not what we thought it to be. True ambition is a deep desire to live usefully,
and to walk humbly under the grace of God. May you be sober one more day. May you go to one more meeting and tell one more story and surrender one more pain. And we will see you on the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. Okay, everybody, what did you think about Miss Brenda J there? She is absolutely something. If you need to reach out to her, um, feel free to email me at john, J-O-H-N, at soberspeak.com. And if you need to reach out to any, I mean any, of the uh, speakers, uh, feel free to reach out to me and I will get you, uh, I will pass your comments along to them. I'll put it that way. All right. Donna on the listener feedback. And by the way, I am sitting here in the beautiful, well, in fact, why don't you go ahead and tell them where we're sitting today, Miss Shannon. And this is Miss Shannon, my bride. So where are we sitting today, Shannon? Hello, everyone. We are in Crested Butte, Colorado. It's absolutely beautiful here. We're up on the mountain. Currently. And it's probably around 10,000 feet or so where we are sitting right now. Yes, the elevation is between nine and 10,000 feet. So we're getting high in Rocky Mountain, Colorado or something like that. Nonetheless, <laughs> all right. So and so a lot of times I just get tired of my own voice. Uh, so I asked Miss Shannon to come along here and help me to read listener feedback today. So Donna Mack writes in regarding Miss Billy Kay. By the way, Miss Billy Kay was two episodes back. And um, anyway, uh, Donna Mack says, Hi, John. I am a newcomer to the program, AA, and listen to the Sober Speak podcast every week. I love the speaker this week, Billy Kay, and I'm looking forward to the possibility of future topics with her. Thank you so much for what you do, and I look forward to the podcast. Kindly, Donna Mack. A sobriety date of 3-31-2019 from the Palm Harbor, Florida, Tampa area. All right, Ms. Shannon, go right ahead. All right. Um, so Lisa writes in. Lisa is in Al-Anon, and she writes in about the Billy Kay episode as well. It says, Hi, John. My name is Lisa J. I recently found your podcast because of the episode with Spencer and Amy from The Recovery Show. I am in recovery in Al-Anon, and that show is my go-to between meetings. But I am glad to have found your podcast, too, because I very much want to understand addiction recovery from my qualifier's point of view as well. Let me share some joy and hope. My qualifier is my husband, and he got his one-year chip last week. He is in deep in the middle of his program, just got his first sponsee, and he inspires me. But now to get to the reason for writing. I absolutely loved the episode with Billy Kay. Almost everything she said resonates with me. Learning that I needed recovery as much as my husband did was surely what saved our marriage. I looked into the BBA Works website. Of course, there are no groups for that where I live, but I'm definitely considering a big book study for my own recovery journey. I wish Billy Kay could be my sponsor since I have not found one yet. Please pa- pass along to her my appreciation for her sharing. I look forward to hearing her on Sober Speak again. Hint, hint. Thank you for your podcast. I am glad for both it and the recovery show for keeping me in the 12 steps between meetings. Blessings, Lisa J. And before you go on to the next one, Miss Shannon, I just want everybody to know I did... Uh, connect uh, Lisa and Billy Kay, and I will let their journey take place from there, and I will get out of the middle of that. So go on to the next one, please. All right. Craig writes in from Canada. Craig is an Al-Anon man- uh, member, sorry, and he is also writing in about the K- Billy Kay interview. It says, John, I'm a grateful member of Al-Anon and have been listening to your podcast. I also follow Mark and his guests on the Recovered Cast and Spencer and his guests on the Recovery Show. I very much enjoyed your interview with Billy Kay, and I really identified with her experience of finding open AA talks and the steps set out in the big book to be a helpful part of her journey or her recovery, excuse me. I grew up in a household affected by alcoholism, and my spouse is actively drinking and is in denial of her problem. Hearing the perspectives and experiences of the guests on your show helps in my understanding of the dis-ease and how my recovery has to focus on me and accepting that I am powerless over other people. Thank you for your service and what you do on Sober Speak. 
Craig from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Thank you for writing in from the great white north, Mr. Craig. All right. Joanne writes in also regarding Miss Billy Kay. She said, uh, just discovered your podcast and heard you speaking with Billy Kay speak on the 12 steps big book style. I would love more information on these types of meetings. Can you point me in the right direction? I just realized my life is a mess and the only way I can fix it is to change me. Thank you, Joanne W. Well, I got Joanne uh, also in touch with Miss Billy Kay, and um, uh, she will get you the information that you need uh, regarding the uh, BBA works. Uh, Corinne P. writes in, and guess who she's writing in about, Miss Shannon? Billy Kay. Yeah, that's right. So she says, "Hello, John. Thank you for having me. I have turned on sober. I, I was turned on to sober speak through the recovery show. I am going on seven years in Allen." on six months in ACA, which for those of you who don't know is uh, adult children of alcoholics, and about four months in OA, which for those of you who don't know is uh, Overeaters Anonymous. I am where I am today because of this amazing program and ability to work the steps in my work and home life. Your speaker, Billy Kay, made me feel the tingles with her addiction to adrenaline. I understand that. I love the concept of of Big Book Awakenings as well. I have not worked fully any fellowship steps as of yet, but have decided to do the 12 and 12 in OA first. With gratitude, Corinne P. So just to kind of, we still have some more listener feedback, but just to kind of wrap up those first four or five responses there, I guess if you haven't listened to Miss Billy Kay... (laughs) It would be a good idea to go back and listen to that episode. Once again, Billy Kay, it's uh, uh, Al-Anon served up the big book style, I think is how I titled it. So, all right, Shannon, go ahead, please. All right. We are are next hearing from Deborah from Al-Anon, and she writes in, Hi, John. Two years ago, I realized that my life had become unmanageable, and I began attending Al-Anon. It was suggested to me 20 years ago when I sought therapy to deal with my chaotic FOO, but I didn't relent until I realized that I had married back into my own family pattern. As such, I found your show through the recovery show and decided to take a listen as a means to work on my compassion for the alcoholics in my life. This morning, I flipped through some of your older podcasts and found the episode with your wife, Shannon. Oh, well, I didn't even know you were reading this one, but it's it's about you. This is great. Yes, and that's very sweet. What a delightful person she seems to be. And you are right, Ms. Deborah. She is a delightful person. (laughs) I enjoyed hearing her story, but when she got to the part about OA, I became unsettled. She said so many things about her eating obsession that I could have said it myself. When I got to the office, I looked up the OA website and took the assessment. Now I'm sitting here realizing I need the program in the worst way. Talk about building compassion for my alcoholics. As I read some of the online literature, I have a new perspective. I'm sorry, a new perspective of the torment felt by my active alcoholics in my life. Thank you for the service you do service, which is extending beyond those in AA Deborah. And before we go on to the next one there, Miss Shannon, do you have any idea what FOO means when she says my chaotic FOO? Right. I do not. Actually. I don't either. So if, if you're out there and you're hearing us and you know what that means, uh, just uh, send me a little note. I'd like to know. Maybe we'll figure it out in the meantime. Yeah, I'm trying to think of that option, you know, what, it what that be, acronym But I'm not means. sure. Yeah. 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 Okay. The next one is? Okay, yes. Um, so Jonathan from Al-Anon writes in, John, I wanted to reach out and let you know that Sober Speak and the community of listeners are an active part of my recovery. When anyone reaches out, I let the hand of Al-Anon be there and include Sober Speak as a means to help. Currently, I'm working the steps and can't believe I am on step four. I am leaning a... I'm sorry, I'm learning about myself in the program of Al-Anon. I hope there is a way for you to stream the event on August 30th. If not, I wish you Godspeed with the event and hope to make one in the future. And Godspeed to you, Mr. Jonathan, and that is absolutely fantastic. You're working on your step four, and I know, Jonathan, we've communicated very many times that he is a great guy. And you know what? I asked uh, the the venue where we're doing this uh, August 30th Sober Speak Live event if we'd be able to uh, stream 
the Sober Speak Live event today, and they said they think so. They're working on it. Uh, we're going to see how it works out. So, all right, Casey writes, and thank you again, Jonathan, for writing in. Casey writes in, he says, hello, John. Oh, she says, hello, John. Just wanted to send my thanks and gratitude. I listen to the podcast all the time at work, which I love. I am now 51 days sober and have a list of a list of a meeting for each day in my new location. I am much more aware of my actions since my relapse because of listening to the podcast. And I'm, and I am enjoying new meetings and talking with my sponsor every, every day or every other day and meeting with her once a week. I am also the open speaker for my home group in September at our open speaker meeting. God is good. Thankful to be sober. Another 24 exclamation point. God bless. An exclamation point. God bless. Exclamation point. Casey A. Well, Casey, fantastic. Good luck on your uh, open speaker thing there. If by any chance you get it recorded, I'd love for you to send it to me. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, uh, once again, thanks for writing in, Miss Casey A. Noel. I, I, no, Noel or Noel? Probably Noel. Noel writes in, John, I have had problems with alcohol for 50 years. Years. I have listened to your first 83 episodes of Sober Speak. Um, I've tried other podcasts, but yours is my favorite. I listen on and off, and I have finally made the decision to quit drinking after a guilt ridden weekend. My sister is seven years sober and has my back. The John W. episode I just listened to was good. Oh, that's the John W. episode we're talking about the principles. So many of them touch me personally. Michelle from Auckland, which is a listener who wrote in, made a comment that I related to so much. I've been married for 45 years to a wonderful man who can, who can drink responsibly. He does not understand the addiction. By the grace of God, my sister, your podcast, and you, John, I will make it. I am six days sober. Thank you, Noel from California. Well, Noel from California, thank you so much for writing in. Sure do appreciate it. Nate writes in and he says, "My first, John, my first name is Nate. I am from Tinley Park, Illinois. Uh, Illinois. I am not an alcoholic in the sense that alcohol was the medicine I used to escape everyday life. I use pornography and other things of that nature to escape. Little did I know how deep I was going in. Eventually, I was caught and had to come clean with everything. I am an alcoholic in the sense that I am powerless and my life is unmanageable. I am working to get my life back on track. At first, I thought I was not sure about recovery or exactly why it was needed. I was going to counseling. I was taking medication. I was going to a group called Celebrate Recovery. I'm familiar with them. As much as these helped, and, they, and I think they did, on July 12th of this year, I was going to celebrate three years of sobriety. A friend of mine said something was missing. I removed the sexual stuff, and there was still anger, selfishness, resentment in a lot of things. That friend said I should look at working the 12 steps, that they would really help. I am early in the journey, but I just finished step one. Your podcast has been incredibly helpful. I was just looking for something to fill my commute with. I don't have a home group. I don't attend regular meetings. And that is something I am working on, but not there yet. What has been helpful is hearing people's stories and how they connect with mine. Hearing what the steps mean to people and their advice and going through them was encouraging and has been, and I have been made more confident in doing them myself. Gary K was great. Ricky R was good. Clay D was great. And for, and so far, almost all of them has had something for me. Some of the things I have learned is, quote, being where your feet are, unquote, then distancing yourself from your parents is not going to fix how you feel about them or what you think they did justly or unjustly in your life. Remembering that it is not about your feelings, just some really great stuff. I have really just started at the beginning of your podcast and started listening all the way through. Thank you again. Keep up the good work on the podcast. 
you have a really great group of people down there that are willing to share their experience and encouragement to those of us all over the place. And you are correct. Thank you so much for writing in. Okay, Winley, Jay writes in, Hi, John M. Thank you for adding me to the list. I learned about Sober Speak when my sponsor texted me a link to Brenda J's delivery. And we just had Brenda J on, so they get to hear Brenda J again. Yes, I found it quite something and wanted to hear some more people's thoughts. I live in Logan, Utah. I am in early in recovery and I'm working on it. I liked how Brenda did the third step first. Going to listen to John E's next. Thanks again. We'll let you know how things are progressing with me if you like. Winley J. I would like. Thank you, Winley J. Keep us uh, posted. Keely writes in, I'm from Chicago. I have been in AA for 12 years. I was sober for six years at one point and relapsed for one and a half years. And I'm now very grateful to say I just celebrated four years again. I listened to the recovery show and I found sober speak when Spencer and his wife were on your show. I have two young kids. I work full time and have sober speak as my meeting between meetings. It's a lifesaver. Thank you, Keely. All right, now Kaylin writes in. Now we just had three people there right in. One was Wenley, one was Keeley, and now we have Kaylin. Hey, can't we have a Bob or a Sue out there? Ha <laughs> ha, just kidding. Anyway, all right, Kaylin says, Hi, John. Found this group through the family, f- through the FB Al Anon group, the recovery group. I am the only Kaylin, the spelling that I've ever met, K E L E N, just so you know, that I have ever met. Ha <laughs> ha. I would like to join the the Facebook group. We got her in there. I am the daughter, niece, girlfriend, sister, cousin, ex-wife of alcoholics and addicts, always looking to learn more from a faith-based program. Mahalo. And when she said mahalo, I asked her if she was from Hawaii and she says, got it. Yes, brada. I guess that's B-R-A-D-D-A-H, brada, I guess that's what it is. And she said, I think that's like a Hawaiian for brother. Anyway, she says Maui, no K-O-I- No worries. I have no idea what that means. I think it's something Hawaiian-like, though. Anyway, she says, uh, we are moving to Arizona soon. Thank you so much. Be well, Kaylin. Ellen writes in. She says, hi, Sober Speak. I am 145 days sober and continue to enjoy the messages of hope from your podcast. Buddy, the Taoist from Georgia was really inspirational. Your intro said he lives outside of Atlanta, which is my hometown. Would you mind giving my home my email address to him or sending me his? There are so many ag- agnostics and alternative believers in my home group, and it would be fantastic if we could have him at an upcomer speaking meeting. Thanks in advance, Ellen J. And I got her that information, and I know her and Buddy are communicating. All right. Joe writes in from Horsham, Pennsylvania, and he says, Evening, John. I just finished running 10 miles, and I enjoyed your discussion with Ryan L. All your podcasts are fantastic, and I am so grateful I found your channel. You're a great company while I'm beating the streets. What he's talking about is, well, he just finished running, as you could tell. He says, I remember Ryan was drafted and remember reading about him and his criminal charges and chemical dependencies. So it was great to hear how he turned his life around and is living in as a living testimonial to the strength of the fellowship. I have a picture on my phone of two dogs. One is a St. Bernard. The other is a miniature breed of some sort. Both are muddy. One is up to his neck and the other is up to his paws. And the quote reads, how deep is this mud? Well, it depends on who you ask. We all go through the same stuff differently. To an outsider, observer, Ryan seemed like he had it all. But we all have our crosses to bear. You're right about that, Joe. I thought of that picture as I listened to this podcast. Thank you so much for your awesome work. And I can't read Joe's full name on the air just for anonymity's sake, but I had to write back to Joe in the Philly area and ask him, 
Joe, are you Italian? <laughs> and he wrote back and he says, P.S. Yes, I am Italian. My full name is wonderfully Italian. And once again, I can't read the entire thing. But if you heard it, you would think Italian. You see what I'm talking about, yes. Shannon? is very Italian. And he says, and we are not involved in any waste management. <laughs> <laughs> Which probably would have been your next question. Happy face. <laughs> and you're right. That's exactly what I was thinking, Mr. Joe. <laughs> Be well and happy trails, Joe. So uh, anyway, uh, I hope you're not just swimming with the fishes out there in uh, Philadelphia. <laughs> My wife's looking at me like, please don't do any. Uh, that's a one spaz meatball you got out there in the Philadelphia. I'm so sorry, Joe. I'm sorry, sorry you had to put up with that. All right. So now, Miss <laughs> Shannon's going to read a couple here. Go ahead, Miss Shannon. All right. Eloise writes in Good morning. I had been nine years sober and started having marital issues. I still am. I'm not sure if I'm going to file for divorce or try to stay in it until the kids are out of the house. My husband completely ignores me and not willing to talk to me. When I asked him what he wants to do with our marriage, he still ignores me. After about three months, well, about three months ago, I tried it again. I've been trying to lose weight and get healthy, but the stress of living with somebody who doesn't like you and won't speak with you has been intolerable. So I tried drinking again. I never drank anywhere near as excessively as I did nine years ago. I still drink too much. I have since quit, but the struggles are still there. I live in Roberts, Wisconsin. I have no real support since my husband wants nothing to do with me. My kids are too young. They don't know to know. I'm sorry. They don't need to know what's going on. And my mother's too old. I don't want to expose her to this. So right now I'm struggling alone. Looking for groups like yours and going to occasional AA meetings do help. My best friend has three kids under the age of four and too much going on in her life. I don't want to burden her with this. I've often been told that I'm thoughtful, very thoughtful, and in this situation, I think it's getting me into trouble because I don't want to burden anybody else with my problems. Thank you for the invite. I look forward to listening to your podcast further. Eloise. Thank you, Eloise. Megan writes in on Insta. You notice how I abbreviated that there, Shannon? I do. I sound, don't I sound really cool when I say something like Insta? Sure. <laughs> Megan writes in on Insta. She said, I drank and used for 22 years. It didn't matter what it was. And it was always and and it was always what that I wanted more. I didn't want to stop. I didn't realize I was an alcoholic. Quitting was the hardest thing to do. I was completely broken. I've been sober since 224, 2016. Through AA, I have learned to handle life on life's terms. Drinking and using will not make my life any better. I drank and used to escape escape myself. I hated myself. I was a mother of five children when I got sober. At 18 months sober, God decided I needed one more. I had an IUD that apparently that 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 apparently disappeared and I was blessed with number six. <laughs> Today I am a sober mother, wife, daughter, sister, and friend. I have learned to love myself. I get the greatest rewards giving to others. Life isn't easy all the time and I know it'll have its ups and downs, but staying connected to my higher power and AA, I can get through anything. Megan from Napa, California. All right, another Megan writes in and she says, thanks for the ad She's talking about the ad to the um uh uh, I guess the Instagram, I can't really remember. Was that the Facebook group? Nonetheless, she says, thanks for the ad. I love the podcast. Out of all the recovery podcasts I, I've listened to, yours is by far the best in big capital letters, four exclamation points. Points. Anyway, I'm working on listening to all of them. I can relate to every single one of the podcasts I've listened to so far, and I love listening to them while I'm at work because that's where I used to drink, and I used to... And, and I use the da, 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 drink and use the most on my recent relapse, relapse after I lost six years sobriety. Sometimes it's very difficult working in this type of environment where everything is so easily accessible, especially when I'm having a bad day. That's why I'm so grateful for your podcast because it has helped me 
through so much the past couple of months, which I know I have five months of sobriety. Thank you again, John, for all you do. And don't ever stop. You are helping so much, so many other people. And uh, much love and thanks. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for the kind, kind words. All right. Tara also writes in on Insta. She says, love your show, John M. I'm 66 days sober and feeling positive, energized, and full of hope. Your show really helps me stay focused and calm and provides a good laugh to keep it up. I'm so thankful. God bless. Steve R. writes in also on Instagram and he says, John, I'm on a flight at the moment and I just listened to the episode with Gary Kay. Incredibly powerful. I'm getting ready to start my four step and I'll be using some of the things he has said about the secrets and transparency as a guide for some of the character defects I need to put on my list. Great stuff. Keep up the good works. Regards, Steve R. Tamara writes in on Instagram, and Tamara says, oh, excuse me, I just lost it. Thank you. I just listened to my first episode, number 63. So good. I've been in Al-Anon for eight months and have been branching out to AA podcasts because everyone says I should go to an open meeting, and I'm working up the nerve to do that. Thank you for sharing your experience, strength, and hope. And by the way, uh, episode number 63 was Arlena A, um, which is called God Loves Me and Everything's Going to Be Okay. All right. Najeri Naj- writes in on Instagram. That's N-G-E-R-I. I probably butchered that. I'm sorry. But uh, she says, she or he, I'm not real sure, says, thank you. Sober Speak is the best. I listen to the podcast on repeat, and it's a tonic to my sobriety. God bless you for this amazing work that you do. Amy writes in on Insta and she says, enjoying your podcast. Discovered it this week. I'm a new Al-Anon member. My husband just started outpatient treatment for alcoholism and he suggested I listen to your podcast too. By the way, if you were wondering what happened to my beautiful bride, I don't know really. She just got up in the middle of this and something was going on with the kids and she left. Hey, this is life. All right, but last but not least... Uh, David wrote in on Instagram and he said, you rock three exclamation points. And he says, I love your show and I love your Instagram. One of the things I, by the way, when you say you like the Instagram, I just want to let you know what you're saying is you like Miss Cassandra's posts because she does every, well, I shouldn't say every one of them. She does the vast majority of all those posts. And I'm, I'm so thankful that she's out there and does it. She says, one of the things I like to do as part of my 11th step is write prayers and meditations. I am attaching my recent sponsor's prayer for you. Hope you can relate. Your brother in progress, Dave from the Preston Al-Anon family group. All right, so here's the sponsor's prayer that he wrote in to me with. And he says, sponsor's prayer. First, let me do no harm. Let me offer no advice, correction, or direction. Let me not take their burden, confusion, or danger upon myself. Let me never forget that I can't really know who they are, what they are experiencing, what their past has done to them how much they have to heal and learn, what consequences they need to experience, or what your path for them could look like. I admit, I am powerless over my sponsee, and, and, and I am attempting to control them will make my life unmanageable. I do believe you know them better than I ever will, that you will love them more than I ever could, and that your plan for them through a mystery to me, is good. So I will surrender my sponsee to your loving care and creation. I ask for the wisdom to be faith. Oh, I ask for the wisdom to faithfully share my experience, strength, and hope. I relinquish any responsibility for their miracles or their stumbles. I believe you are great enough for each of us. Amen. All right, so we had a little bit of uh, feedback here this week, folks. 
You guys keep me busy, and I love it. Uh, thank you for all the feedback. I love you. Uh, we'll probably see you next week. Um, God bless you. Adios. Until we meet again. Bye-bye.